Welcome and let's get started. Welcome guys. Uh, super cool to be back again with you guys today. Um, it feels like I just sat here yesterday for our last live stream that we did last week. So it just shows you that time is flying by pretty quick. So if you are watching live, please go ahead and let me know in the comments where you are watching from. And then um, if you're catching a replay, go ahead and comment replay. It's always good to know uh, how many people are catching the replay of these as well. Maybe at a, a different time that's more suited to your time zone. I'll keep an eye on the comments. And if you have any comments, questions, or suggestions throughout the stream today, please uh, take advantage of the opportunity to leave comments. I will keep an eye on those as we are going through the um, stream here today, and then um, basically get you guys taken care of. So today, uh, before we get to that, welcome. We see uh, we've got Darren saying, what's up, Shaw? Hope you're doing well. Darren is one of our repeat viewers. Um, so welcome back, Darren. Great to have you guys. And then we've got Stephen, <clears throat> one of our academy students here from Cape Town, South Africa. If you've not been to Cape Town, that's definitely one of our main tourist attractions here in South Africa. So a great place to be. Um, welcome, Stephen. And Darren is tuning in from North Carolina. We'll try and um, adapt the times that we're doing for these broadcasts to be uh, more suited to the Australian time zone as well. Um, we know that they are eight hours ahead of us and that we are kind of nine hours ahead of Pacific time. So um, we'll play around with the time zones. But thankfully, we've got the replays available for you guys if you are not able to join us live here today. So today we're going to be looking at a variety of some effective warm-up routines and exercises that you can use to enhance your playing agility and ultimately prevent injuries and also improve your overall performance. I'm going to take you through some of my favorite warm-up exercises and techniques that you can help to play more efficiently and expressively in your worship sessions. So we're going to get into that. Um, now, worship guitar is not typically known, you know, to be like super shredding kind of guitar playing with crazy picking and, you know, the typical things that might lead to you getting things like tendonitis and whatever the case may be. So, but still, you still want to warm up because by warming up, it's not just good for the hands and the fingers. It's also good for actually the mental side of your playing. And we're going to go over and talk through some of that. So we've got Jim Dover, um, also tuning in from South Carolina. So we've got North Carolina representing by Darren and South Carolina by Jim. Welcome, Jim. Great to have you. So what I'm going to do is I've got a sound dialed in here. Let me just go ahead and turn off the reverbs and delays. So we've just got kind of a clean tone with a bit of drive there. Now today is actually pretty cold. As you can see, I'm wearing my beanie and a hoodie. Uh, we are in South Africa, so obviously it's uh, winter time. I spoke to someone in Canada today and they were just kind of heading into summer, he says. So it's uh, opposite end of the world. And that's all the more reason to warm up. Now you see, when you are going um, and you start playing on stage, there's a, sometimes a little bit of like stage fright or stage um, anxiety or, or whatever the case may be, because especially if you have to play like an intro part or whatever the case may be, maybe you don't have any of that. Or throughout the song, there might be a moment where there's some free worship and you have to kind of start playing something. And a lot of times, a lot of guitar players might be a bit tentative in that moment because they might not be sure what to do, what, what to play, or you know whether they even have the right tone dialed in. Now, when you work on your warm-ups and you learn how to properly warm up, you are literally just kind of setting the stage for, for what's going to happen. Just making sure you go through the motions and that your fingers know what to do and all those kind of things. So that when it comes time to start playing your first song, you're already warmed up, right? And your fingers are kind of, um, you know, you've set the stage and you are in the right frame of mind in order to start playing. So it might seem like a small thing, but the benefits are massive. At the same time, when it comes to playing guitar, and I'll, I'll do a bit of a jam for us before we get into some of the exercises here. Confidence is very important. 
and your confidence is really determined by how well your um, your muscle memory has been programmed. And muscle memory, that's the kind of things that you use to do things without thinking. So if you drive a car, um, if you drive a manual um, like stick, as you call it in the US, then there's a lot of stuff that has to happen as you change your gears, you know, you're stepping on a clutch and the gas and all these kind of things. You have to get that all coordinated so you can drive, make sure you use your indicators when you're gonna be turning, look left and right and behind you and all those kind of things. But that happens on autopilot, you would agree, because if you have to think, all right, now I need to take my left foot and um, you know step on the, the clutch pedal, and then I need to change from the first to the second gear. Then I need to slowly let it go, and then I need to step on the gas, and while I'm doing that, I need to look to the left and right, making sure there's no oncoming traffic or whatever the case may be. As you can see, even just talking through that takes a long time. So when you are driving, these things need to happen on autopilot. Whether you're tying your shoe, whether you're playing guitar, whether you play a sport, whatever the case may be, those things that happen on autopilot needs muscle memory and motor skills in order to work. So it's very important for you to actually make sure that that is all dialed in so that when you go and you're going to start playing on your instrument, that you've got your motor skills dialed in properly. Because it's at that point that you can play without looking and you don't have to worry about, you know, is it going to sound good or not because you've gotten everything dialed in and there's a ton of different exercises to do that. So what I'm going to do, just to make sure we get a good level over here, we are going to go ahead and just do a little bit of a jam over a simple 1-4 backing track, which is going to be G and C. And then I'm just going to make sure we are good with the audio. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to pop them in there. Um, but I'm going to talk you through a way that you can warm up but at the same time, keep some theory in mind as you want to learn different musical concepts on the guitar. So here we go. G, C. We'll just do a bit of a jam here. So that was kind of warming up in a different way. It was kind of warming up uh, to some musical ideas, right? I know a lot of folks, if they play on a Sunday, they get up quite early just so that they can run through the songs a little bit and just warm up musically. So that's one way in which you can warm up. And you don't have to uh, be too fancy about that. You can literally just, in this case, if you want to warm up with your chord. So this is G. <laughs> four versions of a G, the same four versions of a C. Let's say I want to throw in an E minor. And then a D. Back to my G. So you can do these kind of warm-ups where you just kind of map out the um, chords that you are playing over. 
Or maybe you want to warm up with just making sure your triads are in place. So you might play G. Okay, let me turn off this, these delays. So G. I've got another delay hiding somewhere, so... And then see that I missed that G, so it's going to be that one and then there. That's going to highlight to where you want to work on these kind of things. And then this G. So you can warm up musically as well. Now I'm just running through these exercises real quick. But that's one way in which you can say, okay, great, am I okay with my G triads? Or maybe you want to do arpeggios. So these are what I would call musical warm-ups. It just kind of helps you to set the stage there in terms of what you are playing with. Those are very, very important, and we can look at these to start with. David Belcher saying, good morning from Oregon. Welcome, David. So I'm going to cut to the second cam here, and I'm going to show you one of my favorite ways to do like musical warm-ups. Uh, that will basically be as follows. You can take a scale... And in this case, I'll take, say, the, the G major scale. That's my scale right there. Now, playing the scale up and down like this is okay, but it's a little boring because it's literally just up and down. So I like to use sequencing to kind of make that scale a little bit more exciting and also to kind of train my ear a little bit so i might play patterns of four so all that means i'll play up four notes i'll start in the first note i'll play up four notes so one two three four then i start in the second note play up four notes third note four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve 13. So I had 13 groups of four that I've just played there. And as you can see, that's a little bit more fun to play than just a scale up and down. The scale up and down sounds like this. A little bit boring, and you kind of get through the, the first part of the scale to the next part of the, you know, the bottom to the top really fast. Whereas if we do sequencing... get a lot more mileage out of your scale and your fingers are really starting to I even feel like my fingers are warming up a little bit and it's almost like they're waking up a bit right uh, I can play it in reverse so all right so that is a cool way in which you can practice those exercises and um, we've got John asking where are those backing tracks from so um, we've got a, a thing that we call the WGS practice pack and I can see if it's possible for me to show that let me just have a look here real quick to see if that's possible for me to show um, let me just see in I don't think I'll be able to show that right this very second, but if you go to our website, which is worshipguitarskills.com, we've recently made a change. So let me see if I can um, actually bring that up. But if you go to worshipguitarskills.com, you'll be able to see in the top navigation bar, I'll quickly go there so I can just guide you through that process, worshipguitarskills.com. And we'll put the link for you in the bottom part of the, um, in the description area. Let me just see, what would I need to do to share this so I can show you that, John, uh, see if that's going to work. Um, that's not what we want. Okay, but in any case, worshipguitarskills.com, go there and then click on um, course store. And then there's going to be a course that you'll be able to look at. It's called the WGS Practice Pack. And what we've got in that course is over 600, um, what do you call it, 600 backing tracks 
um, in different keys and things for you to actually go ahead and check out. So feel free to check that out at the site. Having a backing track is quite useful in, in the sense of actually playing over. And I can even take this example that I've just done, and it's probably not going to sound amazing, but I can play this, this, um, this G backing track that you've just heard me play, and I'm just going to play this exercise over that. So let's hear what that sounds like. And then the steak. So that was obviously um, just to show you if you don't want to practice just on your own with a metronome, you can actually put on a track and we have some of those tracks at the site where it's, everything is just in one key. So you can actually play in G and you can do all that kind of stuff. Right, so that is the, where the backing tracks are from. You can go and check them out. Um, and before we go into the next one, let's answer this question. I'm happy to throw these in as well as we go throughout today. So. Uh, Samurai is saying, good day, how did you start off playing in church? Yeah, that's a great question. I had a friend at school who um, studied music um, at school, and that was a long time ago, um, I guess 25 plus years ago. And in our country at that time, music wasn't the typical subject you'd have at school, so it was kind of odd for him to study classical music, but this guy was a really great musician. And um, we started going to uh, a charismatic church together back in the day. That was in 1992 or 93. And um, I've never been in that kind of a church before. So we both got saved in the church. And then they had a typical praise and worship band. And at the time, it was kind of Ron Canoli's Hosanna and the early Hillsong stuff. And that was kind of the vibe back then. And they had this electric guitar player in church that was really kind of um, intriguing for me, just kind of hearing that kind of music uh, played in church. But I never really focused or thought that I want to start playing. But then my friend, who was such a good musician, he said um, his parents are going to buy him a drum kit. So I must also get one because we kind of, you know, if he bought a particular skateboard, I had a similar one. And, you know, as you do when you're kids. And even though I knew nothing about music, I just knew that, you know, bands don't have two drummers typically, right? So I decided instead of buying drums, I'm going to buy a bass. So I bought a bass guitar um, for, uh, it was actually a PV bass guitar. And as you know, they make amps. They're not really known for, for their guitars um, back in the day. But that's how I started. And then they needed a, a bass player in church. And I started playing um, music in church. That's actually where I learned to play. Um, I started on a bass. And then another friend of ours, could already play bass and we said, well, let's start a band and we didn't have a guitar player and that's when I kind of got upgraded to learn how to play the guitar. So all of it actually started in church like a lot of people's musical journeys and through that, I then went and pursued a career to become a professional musician um, and that kind of, yeah, just evolved in touring and learning more about music, studio recording, eventually started teaching guitar and here we are today. So that's kind of the journey and I find that when you play, say, blues and rock, and those things are fun to play, but when you play in church, it's a whole different um, kettle of fish, so to speak, not just stylistically, but in terms of the, the role that we are there to serve. And when you combine you know, your love for playing music and playing guitar, and ultimately your love for God and the way that you want to express that through worship and also create an environment to bring others along the journey, you know, that's quite a special opportunity to do that um, with your gifts and your skills. So, um, yeah, when you see God and you ask him, you know, how can he use you with your specific abilities and talents that he's given you, um, obviously he'll make a way. So that was kind of my journey, how I started. And that was back in 
93. So it will actually take us to 30 years now, um, three decades later. And I'm still doing it and loving it. And um, that was essentially the whole journey there. And these kind of things as it relates to warming up, this is stuff that I didn't know back then. So I guess I could have been further along had I known that if I treat my um, guitar practicing with a little bit more discipline and these kind of exercises will build muscle memory and my motor skills, um, you'd be able to actually make a lot more improvement a lot faster. So thanks for that question. And um, let's go ahead and check out our next exercise here. Um, and by the way, these are all in our latest YouTube video as well. So with tabs and things as well, if you wanted to go and check those out. But I just mentioned instead of playing groups of four, uh, let me just get this. There's a sneaky delay on here. Okay, I think this actual patch might have had three delays on. Okay, cool. We're good now. So... Groups of four is a great one to learn, and you can also do groups of three. This is where once you get to concept, you can go ahead and do it yourself. So instead of playing one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, every time you start on a new note, you can just do one, two, three. So that'll sound like this. And then one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. That's a groups of three. So those work super well. You can do them on pentatonic scales, groups of four. Or groups of three. And a lot of these things actually become part of guitar licks. So... Right, you can actually use those um, to warm up and play some licks as well. So that's one, the, the two things where you can do groups of three, groups of four, you can do groups of five. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, etc. They will become more trickier, so I'll recommend sticking with groups of four and groups of three. But another favorite is actually playing intervals, and that is where I'm gonna play my first note and then my third note. So this is groups of, um, sorry, not groups, these are broken thirds. So if I were to play my first note and my third note together, my second note and my fourth note together like this, but in one scale, that is what that would end up being. That's groups of, uh, that's broken thirds. Then you can take that broken third and you can do it in the next scale shape. And this scale shape. Um, Etc. Etc. So those are groups of four. Sorry, I keep saying groups of four. Um, those are broken thirds. I can do broken fourths, which is what I meant to say. The first note and the fourth note. And, and in reverse. Broken fifths. Etc. and six and sevens as well. Now, these exercises are really some of my favorites to do because they're using a scale. So not only are you practicing your fingers to fret the notes and picking them in time, but you are getting used to playing different intervals you wouldn't normally play. You see, if you just revert to muscle memory, 
a lot of people might just play something like that every time they pick up the guitar. It's the muscle memory taking over and it's not you actively thinking what you want to play because you're just kind of going through the motions. When you do some of these exercises, like I even showed you that broken fifths, these are not necessarily things you would normally play if you just left your own devices to follow muscle memory. So it's going to help you to play new shapes. That's the first thing. Secondly, it's going to sync up your left and right hand, left and right hands together. That's the second thing. Thirdly, it's going to start showing you some things on the guitar and patterns to demystify the neck. Like if you look at a piano, it's all black and white and you can clearly see what your patterns are going to look like on the piano. But on the guitar, it's not the same. You don't see that black and white. And on the piano, you only have one version of this E, but on the guitar, you have one, two, three, four, five. And if I had 24 frets, I would have six. So this just helps you to kind of orient yourself in terms of the notes that you're going to play. So that's the first kind of exercise whether you do sequencing, which are those groups of four and groups of three, or whether you do your broken thirds, broken fourths, broken fifths, those are intervals. And then the final thing I showed you a little bit of that is just triads, right? Making sure you know your triads. And you can practice them in a vertical fashion like I'm doing now. See, I'm going through all of my vertical triads like this. Or you can say I want to practice them in a horizontal way. So then it'll be G, 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 G. And then G, 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 G. And then G, 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 and G. And then G, G, G. I have to think about the butt on a little bit as I'm talking and playing at the same time. But what I'm doing is I'm doing exercises that contain a specific um, melodic way of thinking about the guitar neck. And the final one that you can do that is a good one um, is arpeggios. Because now I'm playing my triads as broken notes. And then even just by doing this, you're starting to train your fingers not only how to play the notes, but where the notes are. And your ear now starts to actually hear, okay, great, if I'm gonna have this finger there, it's gonna sound like this. And um, at some point when you really learn to trust your knowledge of the fretboard and your ear, sometimes if you hear a note, you can just move your hand to a specific place in the guitar. And many times you can actually uh, play that note without even knowing what note it was or looking at the guitar. Just by that can be a fact of muscle memory. So those are a couple of good things that I like for more melodic exercises. And then on the last YouTube video that we did, I showed you a cool choral exercise. And let's cut to the second cam here. It's basically these four fingers. I swap the outer fingers. I swap the middle fingers. And I swap the outer fingers. And then again. A guy called John Petrucci, I think he, he makes use of this exercise a lot. So that's a good exercise because it's going to become almost like going to the gym. You know, if you do weight exercises the first few times is easier. But the more you do them, the harder it becomes to maintain that pressure. And when you do an exercise like this, try not to use too much force. Because sometimes we are pressing, we are fretting the cord much harder than what it needs to be fretted in order for that sound to come out. So that's another way in which you can use economy of movement to try and you know not be use excessive force on the guitar because that's going to lead to fatigue in, in your hands as you are playing. So there's a couple of other chromatic exercises like this one. Uh, I made a mistake there. So see, it's highlighting some, some weak areas, but this is exercise, it's not really melodic, but it helps you to get out of your rut that you might have when it comes to playing guitar. So I would recommend those two exercises um, that you can go ahead and um, practice to not only warm up your fingers, but to learn 
where the notes are and to train your muscle memory so that you can do this stuff on autopilot. So when it comes time to play something through like a solo or whatever, you're not going to be stressed about it because you've got the muscle memory to help you um, through that process. We've got Phil White tuning in from London, UK. Welcome, Phil. And uh, Samurai is asking, is guitar theory necessary to progress on the guitar? That's a good question. Um, let, me, let me see if I can show you guys this. Um, and I'll just talk to you about why I think it is a good idea to have that. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and let's just see. Is that actually going to show up for us on the iPad? I just want to see if that's going to work. All right, I'm not able to get my um, iPad to, um, to stream yet. Let's just quickly see if that's going to work. Um, I might have to just change something. There we go. It's uh, it just woke up. So let me go ahead and, and create a new a new thing for you guys and just talk you through this. So I think it's useful to learn theory on a guitar for this reason. If you go ahead and look at how you can learn to play guitar, and let's get a, a nice thick color here. Um, a lot of people, if they ignore one thing then it's almost like a car with three wheels. So I like to think of the four important things as V, A, M, and P. And that stands for VAMP. And obviously conveniently uh, named as a VAMP, as something that you would do on the guitar from a musical perspective. But V stands for visual, right? This is where obviously when you learn the guitar, you're going to learn the shapes. I showed you guys some shapes but that you can really just actually see what's going on in the fretboard. The next one is A that stands for oral. That is where you start to train your ear. So here we can see this is obviously your eyes um, for visual, right? For visual is your eyes and then your ears oral. Now the next one, I'll, I'll leave M for last. P is physical. This is where you need to have this muscle memory, like I mentioned, in order to play certain things. If you wanna play an arpeggio or scale or whatever the case may be, you need the physical skill to do that. So it is possible to know what the shapes look like on the guitar, to kind of know what they sound like, and to be able to play them on the guitar using your muscle memory to be able to do them without thinking. So you can get around with just these three things. But the third one here is what I call the mental side of it. And this is where you get to understand the theory behind the concept. So the, even just that thing that I just mentioned about broken thirds, you need to know the theory of a third as an interval, a major third, a minor third, all these kind of things. Or when you have to figure out a chord, or when you need to figure out a progression. I like to use this a multi-layered approach to learning where you can see what the shapes are on your guitar as part of the visual part of it. You, you know what things sound like, so when you hear a major third versus a minor third, you can tell the difference. When you hear a progression, a 1, 6, 2, 5 versus a 4, 1, 5, 6, that you can hear what the sound differences are. You actually know the mental side of it, which is your theory, what is a major triad. Well, a major triad is your first, third, and fifth notes of the scale, and that's going to give you your major triad. And then obviously the physical side of it, which we covered today, which is all about um, being able to understand what you are doing. So I would say Samurai, it's definitely necessary to learn guitar theory, but here's the good news. You don't need to go into stuff like learning the modes of the melodic minor scale or even the modes of the major scale, because you're not really gonna use that predominantly in church. And I'm saying this if you are mostly playing guitar in church and you are short on time, then it doesn't make sense to go and learn theory that you're never going to use. You wouldn't have to learn a bunch of diminished um, sweet picked arpeggios across the whole neck. Um, you can see this never going to use them. But you would need to know what different progressions are, what triads you can play where, what scales you need to use um, to improvise and all those kind of things, right? So that's what I would totally recommend just to um, learn how to do those kind of things when you are practicing guitar and why theory is important. 
All right, so I would encourage you guys to go and check out our last YouTube video that we published. Um, that is going to um, show you a bunch of things as it relates to some cool exercises. We added images and tabs to the video. So um, those will really help you. And then if you have any comments or questions right now, uh, feel free to throw them in the, the comment section. I know we have a little bit of a delay, um, but feel free to pop some of them in here. And I'm happy to answer a few questions as we start to wrap up today's um, episode. Um, if you are new here and you want to uh, get notifications of whenever we're gonna go live with these shows, just go to thatworshipguitarshow.com. You'll be able to join a notifications list. We will let you know whenever we are streaming these live. And you'll also get access to all of the replays in one handy area. So that is thatworshipguitarshow.com. And if you are watching the replay, then uh, we've got a, a form at worshipguitarskills.com forward slash questions. And when you go there, you'll be able to ask any questions that I will answer on our Q&A episodes, uh, so feel free to go and check that out. And then if you are watching live or even as part of a replay, um, if you have any comments or feedback about this particular episode, you can go to worshipguitarskills.com forward slash feedback and let us know what you enjoyed, what you'd like to see more of, what you think we can improve, uh, because our goal and purpose here is to serve the worship guitar playing community as a whole and help all of us to really elevate our worship guitar skills so that you can develop your skills, enhance your sound, and ultimately find that unique style that you want to use in your own playing. So those are a couple of links. We'll put these in the description as well. And if you have any uh, questions, I haven't seen any come through yet. Um, we've got a bit of a delay, but if there's no questions, I think um, we'll do one more playthrough and then we'll go ahead and wrap today's um, show. So what I'm going to do just for the replay, uh, sorry, for the, for the delay component, if you have any questions, you can pop them in. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead, now that I'm a little bit more warmed up, I'll go ahead and do another jam with that track that we used earlier. And let me see here, have I got my Ebo around here? I was going to whip that out for a bit of fun. I do. So um, why don't we keep things interesting? I'm going to go ahead and grab my Ebo and play a couple of things over this track. Here we go. <laughs> It was awesome being with you guys today. Thank you for tuning in, for watching live, catching a replay. If you need anything more, we've got a ton of videos on our YouTube channel. Um, if you want to submit questions for future episodes, you can go there at worshipguitarskills.com. If you want to sign up for notifications, just go to that worshipguitarshow.com. And I look forward to seeing you guys on the next episode. Be blessed. Have a good one. Thanks for tuning in. And we'll see you guys soon. 
Cheers.